It's a time. Welcome. My name is Brad. I'm the pastor here at Beyond Church. At Beyond, our mission is to live God's love beyond ourselves so that all of Castle Rock can know God's love. Uh, we do that in various different ways that you've probably heard, but I just want to invite you to participate fully here on a Sunday morning as you were invited to this morning. Uh, that's the first step to what we're doing. Uh, we're in a six-week series on identity that we're starting the year off with, uh, which is trying to help us answer the question, who am I and where do I belong in the world? Uh, we answer these questions with a lot of different identities, and what we're looking at is how does a Christian identity help us answer some of those deep questions, the deep needs that we all have. Uh, the one question that we're going to be talking about today is, uh, do I belong? Oh, here, let me turn this on, and then you can even read it, just in case. Uh, yes. Do I belong? So here, this, this is a, a big fundamental question. Wherever we go, uh, we want to make sure that we belong, right? That there's community around us that can affirm us, encourage us, support us, and be who we are, who we say we are, according to our identity. Uh, we, as a church, it feels like we should be able to answer this, like, easily. Like, we meet every week. We're called to love one another. Like, this should be a home run for us. If you look around at just any other identity uh, that's out there in the world, uh, they can't do this question as well as we do. Like, um, they could be like political identities, ethnic identities, sexual identities. You can have support, but they don't meet weekly. There's not like a gathering where you come together just to like be in. I mean, you can have meetings, but we're like built in with this. The people that do meet regularly, like uh, sport groups, like Broncos fans, right, they'll meet weekly, at least during the fall. You know, or um, if, you're, if your identity is built around your occupation, your job, your work, you're at least five days a week. After COVID, maybe one or two, I don't know. <laughs> That's us for your bosses to figure out, right? But you, you might meet together, but you don't have a command to love one another, right? Like it's not, you're not supposed to be building each other up within that identity. So like there's no identity quite like the church if we're executing this the way that the Bible says. The church gathers together weekly for the point of loving one another, accepting each other, affirming their identity in Christ. We've said that your identity is being loved by God, seeing yourself in the mirror as one who is loved by God. Uh, the church should do this really well. There's a beautiful illustration that Paul writes uh, in the, the book of 1 Corinthians. We looked at 1 Corinthians 13 last week. That's the love chapter, talking about love is patient, love is kind. And I said, Paul was writing in the context of the church, not for relationships, not for families, not for uh, spouses. He was saying us here, like at, on a Sunday morning, we're supposed to love one another with this perfect love. Uh, do you know uh, where he was going with that? Do you, like, so that was 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Do you know what he wrote right before that? I'm waiting for one of you to say 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? I know you guys were all thinking it. <laughs> and it, yeah, yeah, in chapter 12, he's talking, he starts with the gifts. Everyone's been given gifts. And then he uses this illustration about us all being one body and different parts of the body. I want to read that to you. And this is the picture of what do I belong should look like for a Christian. All right, this is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to do verse 12 uh, down to 20. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. This gives a brilliant illustration. It, it keeps going. You, you can read it further if you'd like. But what Paul is saying is that the church is meant to be different, diverse, have different roles, look different, play, play different parts, but all be unified in Christ. And specifically, the Spirit is playing a primary role in binding the church together. So what we did this morning is, is trying to represent that. We all worship God in different ways as, a, as opposed to us looking at each other like, mm, I don't know about this guy, you know? Uh, it's meant to be all of us together in unity worshiping God. That's the beauty of it, right? Do I belong? Absolutely you belong because you are actually not just belonging, but you're needed, you're necessary in your differences, in your distinctness, right? Now here's, I think, I'm just going to assume we kind of know this. We know the church is supposed to be where we belong. 
Um, I'm not going to preach this passage. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to guess you guys already believe this or you're along that line. I want to assume that because I want to probe a little bit further. <laughs> I want to say, well, then why is it sometimes difficult to belong at a church, right? Like why, why does some, I mean, if the church is this perfect body, you know, and we're all, you know, playing our own role and looking different, but we're all unified, how come sometimes it's difficult? There's barriers. You know, we, we, we don't fully belong. Uh, that's, that's where we're going to go uh, today. Um, and in particular, I think for like the North American church or churches at least I've been a part of, you've, you've probably been a part of other churches that don't have this problem. Uh, when I look at the, the body that Paul describes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, then I look at the church and I see a lot of, what, ears? I don't know, like they're all the same. You know, like, like almost every church looks the same, but even within the church, look at the people. It's almost like, it's like we're on like an assembly line of like dolls and we're all the same doll, but we're all like painted different. Or like those squishmallows, you know, they all have like the same general shape and everyone's trying to collect them and they're all the same thing, you know, but, but they're like, oh no, this one's actually the cowboy, you know, and this one's, the, and you're like, okay, I get, it's like, it feels like we're all, you know, coming from the same mold. Why are we so similar if here we are supposed to be this beautiful, different functioning, as different as a hand is from a foot and ear to a nose, uh, I was joking uh, with, with someone where it's like, it's almost like we all have one gift and the same gift, like the gift of receiving, you know, and everyone just kind of shows up and receives, you know, and it just feels like if I wanted to be critical of the church, um, which you, you want to be gentle with the church, um, I, don't, I don't know if we're fully operating as a body, right? And, and therefore, I don't know if we fully belong because we don't look quite like the diversity we're supposed to have. Um, that's what we're looking at. So, we're, we're going to talk about what are the barriers to church. That's one of the discussion questions afterwards, right? Like, what are the barriers to, to feeling like you belong in a church, right? So wh- wh- where are we stumbling as a church? Where did the church in Corinth struggle with, right? What was their barrier? So Paul's writing a whole letter. Uh, we'll, play, we'll play the quiz again. So 1 Corinthians 13 is about love. 1 Corinthians 12 is about gifts and this body metaphor. 1 Corinthians 11 is about... Now, here's a hint. Here's a big hint. No, look, I wrote in my sermon notes, like, look, if you brought a date, now's your chance to impress them, you know, to church. But I don't, I don't know if anyone, anyone does that. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like what a pastor would think. You know, it's like, oh, perfect first date. Let's go to a church. I tried that one time on a girl, and it didn't work out. And then I met Sherry, and it worked. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, you got to find the right one. Woo. All right, no, I'm off script now. Uh, all right, big hint for 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This actually contains the verses we quote the most here at church. Does that help? That's, it's almost more confusing. All right, here, here. I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. This is, this is in 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, I almost stepped off. 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, That feels completely different than what we were just talking about, right? Um, But it's actually the cause of the problem that Paul is correcting when he's talking about 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, about the gifts and the body and differences and unity and the spirit and the wealth to love within it. Um, I, I want to take a, a short aside. We'll leave that over there. We'll pick it back up. Uh, these words, these verses are powerful. We say it once a month when we take communion together. We all grab our elements. We sit back at our chairs, and, and we, I, I repeat this. And then we take these, the bread and the cup, and I usually say something like, this is the whole reason why we're here, why we gather. If, if Jesus didn't die on the cross, if he didn't share his life with us and offer us his life, we don't exist. We don't gather. We, we aren't, there's no church. You know, there's no faith. Um, and then as you study the early church, like churches in Corinth, the churches in Acts, churches in the first cent- centuries, their whole worship gathering was around this practice of communion. Uh, and so starting next month, we're going to take communion every single Sunday. We're going to add it into our church service because this is really the center of why we're even gathering. It's not a show. It's not the music. It's not me preaching. It's actually experiencing Christ, participating in his death and his life together with him. So we're going to be doing that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the the details, uh, but we're going to do that. And I invite all of you guys, participate in communion, 
every single day, every single Sunday, every single day that we gather as a church uh, starting next week uh, in February. <laughs> Thanks, Carter. <laughs> okay, what is Paul saying here? He wasn't, he wasn't telling the church in Corinth, here's, here's what you're supposed to do when you gather. He was saying, when you're gathering and taking the Lord's Supper, you're doing it wrong. Look, this is, this is the context. I want to read uh, verse 17 down to 22, so right before where I just read. He says this, And the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Ouch, Paul. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. That's sarcasm. That's, that's not Paul saying that you need that. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Ooh, Paul's hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you imagine, right? Like the church is gathering, like, hey, we got, a, we got a letter written from Paul. Like, come around, let's listen to it. You know, it's like, about these things, I have no praise for you. Your meetings are more harm than good. It's like, you can stop. You know, like, read that one in your office. You know, don't, don't share that with the church. Right? What's happening here? The church is gathering. They're very aware of the differences in each other. They're so aware they're going to treat each other in their differences, right? Some people speculate that perhaps there's uh, just like social status. There's like a hierarchy. The people with class would have the meal separately, and then the people who don't have anything, they'll be down here. And perhaps what Paul's saying is, oh, sorry, there's none left for you. You know, while they're, they're partying over here. He's like, church, that's not church. You know, you're not together at all. So then he says, no, look, we all have differences. We all have giftings, but it's like one body where we each have different roles to play. So he's like, you better notice those differences, elevate them, honor them. They are not just, they don't just belong here. They're needed, right? So you can't push them aside, right? Their problem was that they were selfish, right? Their barrier to belonging was their own selfishness and seeing the differences and, and wanting that to, to separate them, to, to segregate them from other believers and the gathering. Uh, how about us? Like, I don't know. We don't do that. <laughs> you know, I was like, we all take communion together, so <laughs> we're good there, right? Okay, like, let's push further, right? Where does our selfishness come out? Where is it displayed here on Sunday? Like, now look, if, even if I want to critique, we, we, we're beyond church. Our mission is to live God's love beyond ourselves. Most of you guys come to this church because you like a mission that is selfless, right? That says, like, not me. Let me do it for other people. You know, so it's like, I don't think this is us, is it? I don't think it is, not in this way. I think the way that our selfishness comes out, the barrier to belonging in our church, um, and maybe others, is, uh, oh, yeah, this is perfect. The barrier to our belonging is our blending. <laughs> you see, because I chose a color that looks the exact same color as the background, you can't see it. Now, here, here, here's what I mean, right? So the church in Corinth recognized the differences and lived into those differences in order to stay stratified, that di distant from each other, separate, right? We see differences and we say, ooh, let's not make there be differences. <laughs> you know, we, we try to blend in. Like, look, for example, I said, Tammy, lead us in worship however you want. Go far, you know, like push us, right? Like we know that you worship in spirit, so you, you, you push us a little further, right? That's tough for some of us right? I don't know if you grew up in churches that I grew up where like raising your hands was like, whoa, settle down, <laughs> you know? It's like easy, you know? And so blending in in worship is like a, I'd say about here, you know? You know, you like kind of like look around or you're like, oh, I'm a little sweaty, you know? It's like, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep the elbows bent, you know? Like, like we're conscious of what other people do or like with our kids, right? You know, someone else has their kids just perfectly in order and you're like, oh, all right, let's try to, you know, you're trying to blend in. You don't want to rock the boat, right? And so then when you see someone worshiping freely, there's a little bit of danger, right? Where it's either like you feel like, well, I'm not there yet. And so you feel a little bit like, like oh, I wish I could. Also, you're like, but if you do that, like, then I'm, I'm less like everyone else. Just, just fit in, just fit in, and then we'll all be together with God. I'm worshiping still, you know? Like, there's a tendency for us just to blend in, 
just to blend it. And it's not just worship. It's not just worship. It's, it's what our prayer life looks like, how much Bible we're reading, how we talk about how we're reading in the Bible, what we sound like when we pray. I'm telling you, it's, it's like we're on a conveyor belt of Christians. You know what a Christian is because they kind of talk the right way, right? You know, they read the same authors. They're on the same page. It's like there's that model, and we just kind of, all right, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing, right? We fit in. And there's, there, there could be great reasons for it. You know, I, I don't want to knock this for everyone, but, but it becomes a problem when you're blending in. is not just helping others fit. Or, or belonging, it's, it's hiding. And see, that's where I think some of us hide even in the church. They use the church to hide. For example, Adam and Eve, when they're in the garden, they're in God's presence. God says you can eat any fruit in the garden except for, oh, that one right there. The day that they eat that fruit from the garden, what do they do? <laughs> Let me just blend right in, right? It says this in Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Like, oh, I'm a little too exposed. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you were in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. If we have a sin issue in our life, our natural response we, we know God is mad at us. We've disappointed him. We're not being who we need to be. This is week two of our series, right? What if I'm not perfect? Our natural response is just to like, I'll, I'll, let me duck behind something, right? I'm too exposed in myself. Let me just shrink back. So, so for some of us, that means I just won't come to church, right? That's just like, ugh. you know, if I'm, if I'm face to face with God or other people, like it's probably just safer if I just kind of keep going. I'll, I'll stay in contact and text and, and maybe I'll show up a little bit or I'll watch online or something. Maybe we're hiding in that way. Sometimes you can hide even here in the church where you feel guilty, but if I can just look like everyone else, I'll just skate by, right? I know how to talk. I know how to answer these discussion questions that Brad tosses to us and no one will ever have to know how deep and broken I am or how I'm disappointing God everywhere I go. And so we hide. We even use church and church culture to hide because we try to blend in with everyone else. That's one way, one way that we do this. What if it's not a sin issue? What if it's just a brokenness, a need issue? Or you just, it's a shame issue. It's a, a cultural, you, you don't want to be ostracized by your community. Like the woman who was bleeding for 12 years but she knew Jesus was in town. She knew if she could just touch his cloak, she would be healed. So she kind of like, <laughs> right? Like, you know, blends in with the crowd. She doesn't want to start a scene. You know, um, here, here's the story I'm talking about. Mark chapter 5, 24 through 29. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. This is around Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. For her, you know, a lot of uh, commentators point out, uh, if you're bleeding, you're unclean, uh, which means that other people can't touch you, right? So, so, so her condition wasn't just a physical one. It was very much a, a social issue. You know, and, and so that wrecks her sense of community. Uh, so probably when she doesn't want to cause a scene is she just doesn't want to be known by her peers. You know, it's not just that she doesn't want to stand before God and have to say, you know, Jesus, I need you. You know, like, help me. You know, it's probably like she just doesn't want to cause a ruckus because everywhere she, she goes causes a ruckus. You know, let me just blend in, you know, get what I need and, you know, shuffle away, right? Some of us feel the same way. We actually have needs. Like, we're actually broken on the inside. We, we, like, need Jesus, right? Everyone else is doing just fine, right? Everyone else in the crowd is bustling around God, but we're like, eh, I don't want to wreck this, <laughs> you know? Like, don't, I don't want to make a big deal about this. You know, I'm, I'm just going to, like, reveal everything. Hey, everyone, I've been bleeding for 12 years, ah! You know, like, it's like, let's just approach it calmly, right? So what do we do? We blend into the crowd. We just show up to church, and we'll kind of get what we can get kind of on the edges, right? Whatever, if, if I can get close enough, I know I'll get the healing I need. We have faith in God. We don't want to disrupt each other. We don't want to feel that push from the community. So it's, eh, it's just safer if I hide, right? The last example I have is Peter. You know, this, this is the passionate disciple. He's a leader of some sorts. He's always the one that speaks first, you know, and, and he's the one that Jesus says, he changed his name because he said, on you, on you, I will build my church, right? You're a rock, so he calls him rock, 
you know, and on you I will build my church. And so when Jesus gets arrested, you know, right before he gets crucified, all the other disciples run away, but Peter's kind of like, I don't know, kind of following, watching, seeing what happens. But then when they recognize him, when the crowd recognizes him, say, hold on, don't you belong to him? He's like, oh, no, no, I belong to you, right? He hides, he blend, blends right in. This is this story right here. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. You know, and this is just a tragic scene, right? Peter was so close to Jesus. But when, when his life was on the line, when Peter's life was on the line, he decided it's maybe just safer if I blend in. <laughs> You know, it's like he's bold. He is absolutely bold. Read, read through the Gospels. And this guy, he's the one that walked on water, where he's like, Jesus, let me, let me walk to you on water. Jesus is like, all right, bet, you know. And so he gets out, and then he's, and he's just walking across, you know. And, and now to see him sh shying away, right, when, 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 when his life's online, when his safety is, is potentially at issue here, he says, ah, it's, you know what, it's better for me to play it safe. We do this. I mean, maybe our lives aren't on the line. But when, when it might cause a little bit of either social ostracization, ostr oh, yeah, I shouldn't use that word, um, social distance, yeah, social, social ostriches. You know, like, we want, oh, man. We choose the safer route, you know? So, for instance, being bold in our faith, right? God says, I want you to share this. And you're like, ah, I don't know. Like, what if, that, what if that wrecks things? And so we say, it's safer if I just, I just blend in. I want you to worship like this. No one else is doing that, God. You know, it's, it's probably better if I, just, if I just play it safe. Right? We, we hide probably without even realizing it, and we want to look like each other. And that, that can prevent us from belonging, right? Because, again, if we, if we belong in church, but all we're presenting to church is a little puppet of ourselves that we made, our puppet belongs. We don't belong, you know? Like, if we're, if we're pretending to be everyone else, well, that pretend doll that we're offering the squishmallow or whatever, that belongs, Right, that's in the set. But you, with all your distinctives, with all the giftings, with all the unique things that God's placed on you and is empowering you to do, you don't belong unless you can actually be yourself. Have you ever played hide and seek? Yes, yes, I love it. So I, I played hide and seek for a while, and then I didn't for a while, and now that I have kids, I play hide and seek again. You know, like in our house, like Oakley loves finding the best spots, and he's starting to get good. You know, like he used to just like squat down, you know, and, and you're like, oh, where's Oakley, you know? But now he's like crawling into spaces that only he can fit into, you know, and you're kind of like, hey, Oakley, just like make a noise, make, let me know you're okay, you know? You're like, I'm getting concerned here. But whenever I play uh, hide and seek, the, the, the most fun time I ever had playing hide and seek was with my high school friends. I was in a small town, about 30,000. Uh, we'd go to the Kmart and play hide and seek. Um, and then we'd like go to the gas station or something like that, you know? Um, so one person would count and hide, and then the, the seeker had to go find them. And once, once you were found, uh, then you kind of followed the seeker around. Or uh, if there were some, some of us, it took forever to find them. They found some really good spots. Like there was this one back behind uh, the car seats where there's like these big boxes, but you can get like back behind them. The only way you'd find them is if you like removed every single thing off the shelf. That took us forever to find that kid. But the, the point is, if you're hiding, you have no clue where anyone else is. And, and you don't really even know where the seeker is, right? You just kind of are peeking out of your little crack, and then like, oh, you got me, right? You only know if, if, if you get caught, right? And now you're following the seeker around, or you split up, and now you're finding that, oh, where'd you hide? Where'd you hide? And you find them, right? I don't want our church to be like that, like a big game of hide and seek, where we're all finding our deepest places where we can hide, where we can blend in, and where none of us are really connected to each other. We're all just really isolated. Church can be like that. If we're all hiding... We can all just be kind of sitting there waiting for someone to find us and really being isolated, not belonging at all. The way in this game that you can be in a community is for the seeker to find you. And you know what the great news is? Our God is a seeker. He's a finder, right? Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah, Adam and Eve were hiding. They weren't, they weren't going to hide from God. God found them. And he took a very, a very serious stance on their sin. He didn't play it off like no big deal. It was actually a pretty big deal. They, they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, but, 
But Jesus promised through your offspring, gave them a gift of life, of, of generating life themselves. They, they couldn't do that inside the garden. I don't know if you guys realize that. He said, but through your children, I will defeat that serpent that started this whole thing, an evil. And he went forward with them. And then the, the rest of Genesis talks about the story of Adam and Eve and their children, you know? How about that, that, that bleeding woman, right? She, she gets what she needs, right? And Jesus goes, who touched me? All the disciples are like, all of us? What do you mean? Like, it's, there's a crowd, you know? And he's like, no, 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 no. Who touched me? Right? And so the woman's like, oh, no. Like, that was definitely me, <laughs> you know? He's turning around. I don't know if he locks eyes or something like that. It says she came forward and just told him everything. All right, you found me. You found me. This is me. This is where I'm at. And he says, you're healed. And he healed her in a way that could restore her back into community, right? Not healed, leaving her where she is. We talked about this week, too. But he's going to bring her into the perfected version of her. Peter, right? Can't, doesn't have another word with Jesus, knowing that he's betrayed him before Jesus dies. In the last chapter of John, after Jesus rises from the grave, he meets with his disciples again, and he gets specific time with Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, right? Three times, reaffirming this love, reaffirming Peter's call to care for the church. This is who you are. I need you to do this. Yes, you failed. Yes, we all did, but I'm with you, and we're moving forward. For us in the church, if we want to belong, we have to be found right? We have to recognize where we're hiding, and when, when the seeker says, ready or not, here I come, we say, I'm here, <laughs> you know? And he says, come, come with me. And then we join the community that follows him as he finds more people, right? That's what the church is. That's our community, as we follow God finding people. Uh, the past few weeks, we've uh, encouraged you guys a little bit more to be found. You know, we've said, uh, open mic, confess your sins. Open mic, share your prayer requests. You know, what, what did God tell you, right? Worship in ways that maybe you, you feel in your heart, but you haven't quite felt all the way out to your fingertips, right? We want you to be invited to be found. Let God find you, you, as you, not your puppet. I, I could care less about that. You, that's who God's looking for. We want to encourage you to do that, which also means there's a massive responsibility for us as a church. Our response to people as they're being found has to reflect God. It's very easy for us to be like, ooh, what sin? <laughs> Did she just confess, <laughs> right? You know, or that prayer request, oh, that is ridiculous, right? Or you look at someone dancing, and you're like, what is this lady doing? You know, it's, like, it's very easy for us to do that. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That is Paul being absolutely incensed at us, saying your meetings are doing more harm than good. Our response has to be one of Jesus, who says, I see you in your confession of sin. That's serious. We know that God forgives you. I'll walk with you in that, right? There might be consequences that I'll walk you through, right? It doesn't mean that we, oh, like it didn't happen. It's like, no, but if that happened, all right, but I'll walk with you, right? If, if there's brokenness, if there's needs, if we're sharing our heart, it's okay, what do you, okay, let me be with you. Let me help you find that healing together. Let me accept you though, and then we're gonna, we're gonna move forward together. If it's fear, you know, something that's, that's holding us back, it's encouraging, it's okay. You are called to do this, reaffirming, what is inside each one of us and encouraging them to go. But we have a tremendous responsibility as a church not to act in our flesh as our human nature would dictate, but let the Spirit guide us because it's the Spirit that holds us together in that unity. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, you might have noticed when you walked in today that there's uh, balloons. <laughs> yes, it's like a special Sunday. We have all the different sign-ups. This is kind of for our spring semester of all the different ways that you can be a part of our church. Uh, for example, uh, we have a Bible study every m Sunday morning. I don't know if you guys knew that. 9 a.m., uh, Jim Higgins leads that. They're going through the book of Mark. Yeah, they're going through the book of Mark, uh, but it's always open. You can always stop in. Uh, but there's a committed group, I don't know, about a 10 people uh, that meet uh, before church every Sunday. There's another committed group of people that meet before church every Sunday, and that's the prayer team. Uh, they're on the other side of the church, also 9 a.m. We'd love to have you join that. They just pray for the church and everyone in it. Uh, there's also a community group uh, that meets on Thursday nights, uh, talks further about the sermons, talks more about each other's lives. Uh, that's available, and, and they're looking or they're willing to allow people to join that. Um, and then also, uh, a lot of you have said, I just want more time with each other. Uh, you know, at, at a big church, I think it, uh, groups are really necessary uh, to have people that you can kind of meet face to face. At a church our size, uh, we can do it actually pretty well here uh, with each other. Um, and so someone said that it, it I don't know, it, I don't know if God put it on their heart, but they want to host uh, us just eating lunch together. 
So once a month, we're going to eat lunch together, potluck style, where the church will cover the main dish and the drinks, and you guys just bring sides and desserts if you can. And we're starting that next week. So bring a side or dessert if you want, and we'll just hang out. You know, now that we have spots for kids to kind of run around and games to play, uh, we feel let's just let's share a meal together and have more of this face-to-face time so we can get to know each other, so we can care about each other, so we can demonstrate Jesus' response to us being open and vulnerable to each other. Um, there's also serving opportunities. So I think we have the kids' classrooms, the worship team, uh, and the warehouse are kind of our three serving areas. If you feel like you would like to serve other people, there's those options. We have a new one called the bread team. Uh, if we're doing communion every week, we have homemade bread. I don't know if you guys knew that. So Cynthia uh, makes some sourdough bread. And she's, she said she'd be willing to teach other people how to bake the bread so that we can have a rotation that different people can bake bread from our own church body uh, to be used for communion. So we've got the bread team out there. If that, if that sounds like that's, that's you, we've got that out there as well. Um, all sorts of different ways. Uh, all Together was a project we started last fall where if you signed up for it, you'd be assigned someone and you just had to check in with them every week and pray for them. Uh, and then you were also assigned to someone else, so they would check in with you, ask how they could pray for you, and, then, and so you kind of had this chain of people connected. Um, we kept it, uh, same genders, uh, we're all connected with each other, but so many people created these friendships with people they never would have started talking with, you know, and it kind of continues a uh, whole semester. We're starting that up again. Uh, definitely get connected with that if you feel like, oh, I could text or call someone once a week and then kind of see how that goes from there. Um, we're going to do that through the spring. Uh, my point is there's a ton of different ways you can participate in this body beyond church. It's not all the same. In fact, I don't want it all to be the same. <laughs> so I would love for you to ask God, how do you want me to be a part of this community? What, what of all these things, what are you calling me to right now for this season, for this spring? You know, we don't have a one size fits all. All you guys need to go to this first and then this. We say we want to be a community that's being found by God right? That, that knows that we are loved by God. We're accepting that love. Here's different ways that that shakes out. Here's different ways that you can be face-to-face with other people in that. Ask God to lead you. Where, where does he want you to participate in church? Maybe it's one way, not a, don't, don't feel like you have to do what the, the neighbors are doing or what, what the person next to you is. It's okay if you're doing what God is calling you to do. I'd much prefer that than doing what everyone else does. Otherwise, you're just blending in <laughs> and you can't see anything. We want to see you. We want to see who God made you to be. If we do this well, if we do this well, we will all have confidence to be who we are. We will know that we'll be accepted by the humans because we're accepted by God, right? And so now we can start operating in our gifts. We can't just jump there first. You know, when we come out of our hiding, when we're not focused on covering our weaknesses or making sure we're not looking too out of place, then we can truly be ourselves. We can truly be the part of the body that God has designed us to be in order to function and help the entire body be healthy and know God and worship him more. So may that be our goal here at our church, that we would participate as God has created us to and as God is guiding us each differently but unified in the spirit. Let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your design. I thank you for your creativity. And I thank you that we are different. God, I pray that you'd find us when we're hiding. I pray you'd call us out. Um, See through all those motivations uh, that are mixed in with positive motivations and and show us where we need to be honest, where we need to allow your truth to set us free, where we need to confess or ask for healing or just be present, God. Um, I pray that you'd give us grace uh, as we try to do this together. I pray that we would not uh, judge each other um, from human standards and treat each other as maybe we would in our broken state, but rather we would treat each other as you treat us, that we would join you in finding others. We'd be gentle and loving and kind and work with people right where they're at. Um, I pray that our community might reflect you, might reflect your body. You know, Paul talks about this being your body, not just a body. Um, May it be yours, God. May we be yours, reflecting you to each other and out to the world. We love you, Lord. We thank you for everything you've done. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, we've got some questions. Uh, These are great questions. Um, Please don't limit yourself to the time that we're going to give this morning to talk about them. Um, I think they could really help us apply this. One, how have you seen churches struggle to help people feel they belong? Two, when do you try to blend in with others? And then three, how has God made you to worship? How has he made you 
to serve. Uh, talk about these for seven to ten minutes, then I'll come up and I'll dismiss you guys. I'll join you guys.